Welcome to Open Door. We have been joined by Mr. J.T. Lynch. J.T. is a musician, a music educator, and he is one of the co-founders of the legendary Cleveland jazz group, Horns and Things. Welcome to Open Door, J.T. Hey, what's happening, man? Good to be here. Good to have you here, and I uh, just want to let you know that you know I've been connected to your group for such a long time because we have shared a bass player by the name of Derek James. So I've always appreciated the work and the artistry and and the hard work that you guys put into the music. And I think that's one of the reasons that when it comes to jazz groups in Cleveland, there are only a few that everybody knows of, and your group is one of those. So uh, kudos to you for maintaining a great standard of excellence when it comes to music. Uh, thank you. Okay, so you are a saxophonist. The name of the group is Horns and Things. Uh, for those who don't know, give us some background on uh, the group first, and then we'll talk about your musical journey. Uh, okay, well, uh, I guess the group's been together uh, 37 years. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, all original members uh, except for the keyboard player. He's only been with us about 20 years. Um, and uh, we started out playing over in Akron. Uh, we couldn't get a gig in Cleveland when we first started. And then gradually, uh, doors started opening up and we started playing like Peabody's Cafe, uh, The Reason Why, um, I think Lancers, Arts, so places like that. So we gradually started moving in and, um, you know, we just worked our way through the ranks and uh, we ended up being one of the popular groups. So we had no complaints about that. And with your popularity, you've been able to share some stages with some fairly prominent musicians uh, in in their right, and that establishes you as a prominent musician in your own right. Who have been some of those folks that you've been able to connect with or collaborate with over the years that stand out for you? Oh, man, we, um, you know, I guess in early in our career, uh, we spent a lot of time with the um, with the guys from the OJ's band. Uh, Don Pearson, Bernard Watt, and then uh, we were able to uh, get afforded the opportunity that, you know, we were able to do Freddie Hubbard, Dexter Gordon, uh, McCoy Tyner, uh, let me see, Joe Sample. Um, and then, you know, we were in those festivals with, uh, you know, the, uh, the telephone company used to have the big cool jazz or, or bell something. Uh, festivals at Blossom, and you know we were out there with uh, same time the Miles was there, Buckshaw, the Funk, uh, no, no, Zydeco, the Zydeco band. Uh, man, I'll think of his name in a minute. But um, so you know that that kind of helped spur us along, and then along the way, like guys like you know we could be able to meet guys like Joe Henderson, um, you know Gary Bartz. Um, so, you know, uh, and then there's a guy from Cleveland, Greg Bandy, and through him, you know, we met like Wallace Roney and, uh, uh, Jerry Allen. And so, you know, that in itself kind of helped us George Cables, uh, you know, through our experience of being with all these musicians. I mean, you learn things and you make connections, uh, um, like, uh, Kenny Davis is one of the icons here. And, uh, you know, he lended a helping hand. And then um, over in Europe, Bobby Few, who played with Albert Eiler. So I was able to, you know, go over and be with those guys with the Archie Shep band, Dave Murray band. And I guess you have to mention the, the brother that we ran into today, and that's Kamal Abdul Aleem. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. When uh, when I went to Amsterdam, I mean, he he's like a household name. I mean, he's... Uh, um, you know, he's a musician extraordinaire. Like I said, it took me 30 years to finally uh, get the opportunity uh, to meet him. I guess early in our careers, he was here in town, but I hadn't yet gotten to the set yet, you know. And then uh, by the time, you know, I got because I went to uh, University of Akron. So I was out of the city and then I was out on the road for a number of years. So we just kept missing. But, you know, Kamal Freeman, uh, he's, you know, like I say, he knows Train. And, you know, he played with, like, all the guys, Blakey and all those guys in New York. So mm -hmm. that, you know, that, I think, kind of helped 
you know, forge my attitude uh, that I found that all the legends that I have met were very humble, very down to earth people. Yes. So you, you talked about the longevity of the group and 37 years, and I'm sure that you were playing far before then, but you have a fairly extensive pedigree in terms of the musician. You've also had the opportunity to connect with some of those great names that you mentioned, like Joe Henderson and others. What have you been able to learn from those that you have encountered that you've been able to uh, apply to your own musicianship? Well, you know, I think, man, the uh, two people that um, that impressed things on me, one was Grover Washington. The other was Dexter Gordon. Uh, when we did uh, Dexter uh, stand outside his dressing room, you know, he's a master. He's a legend. And I'm just waiting for him to warm up and Finally, when he started warming up, I was looking for him to blow these long bebop lines. And he just started playing scales and thirds and, you know, just very rudimentary things. And so finally, when he opened up the dressing room door and we got a chance to talk and I asked him and he said, well, if you don't know those, how are you going to play anything else? Um, so just those things, the, the rudiments. And then uh, with Grover, and Grover and I were friends for a number of years. And the one thing that Grover impressed on me was that he reached in his suitcase and he took out an aria, uh, which is a solo piece in an opera. And it's very long and, and, and slow, but that's how you're able to derive your expression. So those two people kind of helped me to realize what I needed to establish in in my personal musical growth. So uh, those are two very influential people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something that's extremely important, and that is knowing the basics. So when you know those scales and you're able to play within those modes, then you're able to uh, reach other places musically that perhaps you wouldn't be able to if you not prepared yourself by by learning the basics. I think that's a really important lesson for young musicians to learn because everybody wants to fast forward to being on stage and playing a solo. But if you don't have the basics, perhaps you can't say what you could say if you had a better foundation. Uh, yeah, because uh, once you understand certain things, then you can communicate. The reason I, that I express to a lot of the young players when you go away to university, they're not there to make you. They're there to help you learn the the language. That's why when I was with James Moody, it took James Moody 20, 25 minutes to explain the principles of John Coltrane harmony to me. Had I not had my fundamental understanding of music, those have just been words lost on me. So the study of music, a lot of times, is to help you communicate your ideas to another musician or for you to understand another musician's outlook on the music. Mm -hmm. Interesting too, um, you know, just fellowshipping with other musicians in town and, you know, some read music and some don't. So, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of 13th chords. I like 13ths and ninths and I write a lot of music with a combination of those two things. But then when it comes to share what you're doing with others and you don't know the language or they don't know the language. It just makes it difficult, you know, and the the other part of it is people come to you and they want you to play something and then they just share a music file with you. And then you, you're so, <laughs> supposed to somehow magically transpose what you hear into your own instrument. And if you don't have a completely trained ear, uh, sometimes that can prove to be a challenge. Uh, yeah, because one of the fundamental things, I guess, is the year, but one of the points you made, like 13th chord, well, now, for someone who doesn't understand the technical part, it's a lot easier to say to them, I'm playing a major scale, but I'm I'm emphasizing the six. So at that point, they realize the 13th is actually the sixth note of the scale. It's just an octave higher. And that, when you see a 13th chord, like to me, I'm thinking immediately, of nine things that this can transform into, 
you know, that it could be I can make a tritone substitution. I could, you know, raise the nine, flat the nine, uh, flat the five, raise or lower the 13th. And using the tritone substitutions or the secondary dominance, that this opens up a whole nother avenue. And the more you understand that, you find in your playing that the great ear is some people have them but what it is is familiarity if you practice certain things a certain way you're more apt to recognize them um progressions you learn certain progressions and you have those and the only thing that it does is it puts you in the position that wait a minute this is in the three six two five then you start looking at the other options and then you can kind of like say someone gives you a file you start listening and hearing and then you start eliminating the different options and t- usually you can find your way. Okay. We got just a couple minutes before we go to our break, but I, I was curious about uh, what drew you to the saxophone and I'm sure you, you play keyboards too, but you know, what we know you for is, is playing uh, the horn. What do you, what drew you to that as an instrument? And you know, I, when I was about, seven or eight years old i saw this guy playing tenor saxophone and on on american bandstand or something his eyes were just bugging out and i just really was drawn to that sound uh and i i it may have been uh louis jordan you know and i've been researching to see if i could find this clip to where i could say yeah no and it, so it may have been louis jordan but uh it was uh, a guy playing the saxophone and bugging his eyes out. And, you know, I just love that sound. So I had a long journey before I got to the uh, tenor saxophone. But uh, that's what actually drew me in. Okay. So did your study of music begin when you were that young? Did you study it in school or have an instructor or how did it happen for you? Uh, Yeah, I, uh, I started playing violin at my elementary school because they didn't have no saxophones and i was going to play the clarinet but uh you know you know that sixth sense in you when they said we need some people to play violin why change from clarinet to violin so that's how i got started on violin okay and do you still play violin uh yeah i mean i can i can do the rudimentary things by no by no stretch of the term even at eight was i that you know, virtuoso violinist, you know, but in teaching, you know, young people, um, you know, you you need to know, have some fundamental grasp of all the instruments. Mm -hmm. And are there any other instruments that you play? Uh, I mean, I could, I could play, you know, like I said, you know, I played bassoon uh, all through uh, junior high school and high school. So, you know, that's a double read that I play. Uh, you know, clarinet, the flutes, or the woodwinds, and I could say, and and I have enough skill on on all of them so that I can, you know, I can instruct them. Okay, we're having a conversation with musician, educator, and co-founder of the group Horns and Things, Brother J T Lynch. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you, and we will continue right here on ninety five point nine FM W O V U. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. We'll be right back. We're not always on the same side of issues, but that's the great thing about being a democracy. But we can all agree on this. The 2020 census is important to everyone. An accurate count determines how many seats our state has in Congress. It also helps inform how billions of dollars in public funding get distributed annually. For things that make our daily lives better, like walk-in clinics, preschool and after-school programs, affordable housing, and hundreds of other programs. So we can all agree, participating in the 2020 Census is important for so many reasons. To find out how you can participate, visit 2020census.gov. Shape your future. Start here. Hey, what's up, y'all? This is DJ Fatty Banks. Dr. Vinaya K. Jones. Alicia Graves. Jordan Lucius. This is Miss V on your radio, and you're listening to the best community radio station in the land. W-O-V-U, our voices united, 959-FM. 
Welcome back to Open Door. We're talking with musician, music educator, and co-founder of Horns and Things, a legendary jazz group right here in Cleveland, playing all over the North Coast and other parts of the world, especially since we're in this virtual world right now. J.T. Lynch of Horns and Things, and uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, before we took our break, we were talking about some of the other instruments that you uh, play, and you mentioned that uh, you started off with violin and then contemplated clarinet before finally arriving at the saxophone. Was it what was it like for you to finally connect with the instrument that uh, started the whole love affair with music? For you? Um, it, it was uh, euphoria because uh, the violin, and then from there. I went to the clarinet, and from the clarinet, I went to the baritone sax. So I played baritone sax uh, through junior high school, and then finally in high school, I was able to get to the tenor saxophone. And um, and then, like I said, you know, I played bassoon and and, and those things, and then I always had uh, a curiosity about the piano. Uh, when I was a, a small kid, my uncle, who was not much older than me, he had a piano. And just watching them and they could all play the boogie boogie, you know. So I, I guess I've always been curious about music. So, um, you know, on the weekends, I mean, my dad played guitar and my uncles and all of them could play. And they played, you know, my people from West Virginia, Pennsylvania. So they were playing guitar, harmonicas, juice harps. And I was, you know, I was introduced to it. And, you know, as a kid, this is like every every Friday, they're getting together, they get off work and, you know, Friday and Saturday, they just sit around and play these guitars. And uh, I had a family friend, like an uncle, he had a gospel group. And they would come to the house and sing and we go to their rehearsals. So, you know, I was always very intrigued and lucky to be around, you know, people who played instruments. So that was really kind of a, an inspiration for you because you saw what they were getting out of it and it, it did something for you as well. And it was a motivation for you to continue with the craft. Yeah, it was because uh, uh, my brother and I had a band. My brother played guitar. So we always had a band. So we, when everybody else was out playing basketball and baseball, we spent our time with this this other family of brothers, and we had a little group, and we rehearsed uh, like three songs all day, every day. I guess I must have had his parents crazy. Uh, we had these three songs that we knew, and uh, and then as we moved on, my brother and I always had we had rehearsal at our house in the living room, and. My parents never really didn't bother them. And my mother would always say, at least I know where eight or nine of them are every evening. So it was something that, you know, the family supported and uh, the neighbors, you know, it was a different time. I mean, the neighbors look forward to our rehearsals on Sunday. Mm -hmm. What is it about a saxophone? that draws so many folks. I mean, it's, it seems locally, if you have a jazz group and there's not a sax in it, there's something missing. Um, I think because it's so close to the voice, to the human voice. Um, and a lot of the shows on Broadway um, with the chorus lines and the choruses, most people don't realize that there's an alto sax player playing with them to help keep everybody in pitch because the saxophone can be overshadowed by the voices and blend in. So you don't even know that the horn is back there playing. Mm -hmm. You know, something else, and, and I've observed this even in recordings of things that you have and I have done together, um, you go through a process of determining which horn fits which song. And I'm, I always wondered what what makes you decide to use one horn over another horn? Um, and, and again, I guess it's, it's the voice. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, I mean, I'm primarily a tenor sax player, but there are times that, you know, I will play the alto 
because it, it kind of fits in that voice. It's 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 like a, a vocalist. You know, you could take a, a baritone like Joe Williams. Yes, and he can sing the song. But if you get a guy like uh, Little Jimmy Scott, you realize, oh, he's a perfect fit for the mood and the atmosphere. Um, and and sometimes, I mean, the, the, the challenge is being able to make the horn universal. Um, sometimes you have to change the key. Uh, they have a, a book called the Omni Book. It's Charlie Parker solos. There's E flat, which is what Charlie Parker played primarily E flat alto. They've transposed it, and you can do it, and it sounds, but it's just not the same as when Charlie Parker did it because it was really for that voice. Okay, so it's about the voice and the way it complements whatever is going along with it in, in yeah. terms of the music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes, I mean, they, they all sound good over everything, but sometimes, I mean, you're just feeling, Hey, this horn is higher and I can, I can do some, do some things just like the soprano. I mean, there are a lot of people are playing the soprano and it's only because of where it sits and the way that it, it can cut and the way that it affects the listener. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, you've been able to play with a lot of musicians locally and a lot of folks know who JT Lynch is. I guess maybe it's the signature look the you know, your, your dreads or your, your, uh, your braids or just your overall demeanor. What does it feel like for you to to be somewhat of a celebrity in in the town that we live in, uh, you know, and I guess I never view it as that. I think that I look at the the community, and you you like to know as many people for me in the community that you can know, and I think that you know m my thoughts are I want you to know me as JT, the person, uh, not so much the musician. Um, because I think being a musician, a, a vocalist, or any type of artist, that I expose so much to you in my music that is so personal that when I see you on the street, I think that you, you like to be able to attach what you felt from that music. You know, I don't think you, you want to hear me playing the horn. I think that it's it's about sharing. And I learn so much from people from the things that they do. And one thing living in the city, it does afford you the ability to be able to move about and engage the community. Um, like the athletes, that, that live here, they can come out into the street because we don't athlete worship in that manner. LeBron was here, he could go to a restaurant and outside of a few people, maybe kids, but most times we're not, we're not in, infringing on this privacy. And this is the one place where you can get to meet people as themselves, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, so I kind of think that that's how I approach it. That I'm just a person in the community, and I just happen to play an instrument. That's beautiful. You know, uh, when I saw you, and I, I'll be transparent with the audience, I saw you today, and uh, you over on Large Mirror at the Unbar. I walked outside after I left, and Councilman Blaine Griffin, hopefully, who wants to be mayor someday, I'm sure. Uh, was just sitting there having, you know, lunch or conversation with someone, uh, you know, being at the shop last year, Jim Jones, or no, Campy Russell just happens to be walking by and, you know, uh, he's known all over the world, but, you know, you walk up to the brother, have a conversation with him. And it's not so much about worshiping someone as it is about acknowledging who they are and what they do, yeah. you know, yeah. but being able to have a down to earth conversation and seeing that, 
that person is more than just the the former basketball player or the the announcer or whatever, but he's he's a person. Yeah, I, I agree. Like when I came out and I saw Blaine Griffin and he's talking with people, but I was able to stop, you know, and say, hey, my hero, mm-hmm. you know, we give the bump and he can acknowledge me as a person. But the same way uh, with our present mayor, I've known him for years and at the appropriate time, he's Mr. Mayor. But if we're at a gathering, it's nothing for him to break off to talk to me and then it's it's jt and frank and we're talking about people in his family i mean because i'm his brother and i have the same birthday we, we're in the same went through high school together uh his other brothers i mean it's it's a thing that that's our past we all came through the same neighborhood and that's what I, I I enjoy about that Shaker Square and just the whole thing because, you know, like you say, Campy, uh, the announcer for the Cavaliers, um, you know, seeing I, I was going to try not to have, I can't remember moment, uh, but he does the announcement for the Cavaliers, but you can see him down to earth, brother. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, he's a former Cavalier. Right. Yeah, you got me drawing a blank too, but he does the uh he yeah, does the col- color announcing, right? Yeah, play play guard. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not Austin Carr. That's it. Austin Carr. Okay. All yeah, right. you got it. Austin Carr. Yeah. Like you say, and and that's the thing that I think that, you know, I can appreciate and I'm able to just be me. I don't have to you know, I don't have to walk out and have my horn with me and, you know, notice me and recognize me. You know, I just want to be able to stop and know people's names and they know my name. And we have any kind of conversation. Yes. You know? Yes. Well, you know, we were supposed to get together in March of this year and then something called COVID just kind of wiped out the entire planet. Uh, so we, we weren't able to get together, but I, I really am looking forward to a day when we can uh, perform together because the, the, the performances that we did, and I'm just thinking about the last one, it was exhilarating and it was exhilarating because of where you took things. And I had the same experience with Cecil Rucker. Same thing. You know, you give somebody something and you say, can you work with it? And then they put what they put on it and it just goes into a completely new direction. And and it's a beautiful direction. So, again, I'm looking forward to that. And I think the audience is looking forward to that as well. Uh, We are talking with the legendary J.T. Lynch of Horns and Things, music educator and musician. And we're going to continue our conversation Right after we take this break, you're listening to Open Door Cleveland with Vince Robinson. We'll be right back. What can you do in the battle against COVID-19? Your first task, wear a mask, protect yourself and others. Armor up, armor up. Get those hands a 20-second shower with soap and water. Armor up, armor up. Give others space six feet just in case. Get good nutrition in jest for digestion. Vitamin C, D3, and more. Elderberries, zinc, and echinacea from the store. Get some fresh air. Go climb some stairs. Let go of stress. Make sure you rest. Your breath is the key to life. Strengthen your immune system, follow the guidelines, and win the battle against COVID-19. Armor up, armor up. When you're in my car, we're listening to WOVU 95.9 FM. We're back on Open Door with musician and educator J.T. Lynch. Uh, before we took the break, we were just talking about uh what we were supposed to do and what we plan to do sometime in the future. But there's this great big elephant in the room and it's called the coronavirus. And it's had a huge impact on the sharing of music worldwide. We're in this place now where you can't have too many people in one venue and people can't be breathing on each other and you have to be six feet apart and 
You know, they're wanting masks to be worn, and this has had a tremendous impact. Uh, what's your feeling or perspective on, on where we are now versus where we were seven months ago? You know, I, I think that um, the, the biggest difference is that seven months ago, it was a shock to everyone that something like this could occur. I think as we move forward, I think we're starting to realize this is here and we're adapting. And, um, you know, like to kind of touch on what you were talking at Larchmere Arts. On Larchmere, uh, the other day, uh, I saw Reggie Kelly uh, and a keyboard player, and they were playing outside the unbar. Um, Willie Ross, um, uh, Marty, Sams, and uh, uh, the drummer, uh, you know, and see, once again, here I am, you know, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, Gardner, his last name is Gardner. Myron. Uh, Myron. Uh, they were playing a set. So what's happening, I think, is that we're going to start making little small things happen and we'll try to impact them as much as we can. I think moving forward, it's going to be the new normal. And as we've gotten this lemon, I think that there's going to be some lemonade made. And, you know, as we talked earlier today, I think that we're going to be able to have an impact uh, on the corona to where we're able to bring out the better things that can happen. You know, we know the health issue is there and we're becoming more conscious even as the cases rise uh, this may be a normal thing that happens in these type of pandemics but I think that our mindset now is that we can survive this and now we can conquer and we can adapt ourselves and we can move through this mm -hmm. You uh, did a concert at the Bob Stop that was aired virtually a few weeks back. What was that experience like for you? Uh, it was it was it was different um, because there was no one there. Uh, so you know we're making adjustments because we realize we we still got to get out and do what we do. Uh, the, the Bob Stop is a great venue to do it. Uh, it looked good. It sounded good. And I think that as as we move. Ford will be doing other things and I think other people will be doing things. So I think we're going to be able to bring the music back to the world. It's just going to be in a different setting. And I think that rather than to say to ignore live, I think that we're going to see in the future that we're going to have live and we're still going to have the streaming. Mm -hmm. But I think there is kind of a reliance on doing it outside so that people can be spaced and still, um, you know, experience the, the music live. But when you're playing to a parking lot full of cars versus playing to a venue uh, full of people and sitting in chairs next to each other, how does that affect uh, your energy in, in relation to performing the music? Um, well, I think, you know, our energy is there, but I, I think that I, I think about that phrase, uh, as we move through life, those, uh, who adapt will evolve. Those who don't become extinct. So I think that we just have to be able ourselves and the people that we just have to realize that, Hey, there's a new way. We, it's new for us. But pretty soon, it's going to be where you're going to see people coming and they'll have their bubbles and uh, we're going to figure out a way for them to be able to express their joy and pleasure so that everyone can hear. So I think that, um, you know, it's it's like you say, all of this is, is new for us and the world. So yeah. I think that as we adapt, um, we're, we're going to be able to... Uh, come out and and, and 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 as they say the old saying is and this too shall pass just don't <laughs> pass as fast as we like right you know I've, I've seen all kinds of things online and I, I, I saw one piece where you basically show up to a concert with a space suit on 
<laughs> that's her- hermetically sealed. You know? You know? Hey, and you know, and and you know, now that you say that, that might be that might be a, a thing of the future. They say, hey, uh, we want to get together. This is what we got to do. Now, maybe you don't need the whole spacesuit, but maybe there's a hazmat helmet, you know, that we can put on, and everybody can still come and do what what they need to do you know i mean because i think that if uh when this first started i said yeah Jack, i'm giving me a hazmat suit but i think that uh you know that you know i see now they've got the face shields so i think man you know that it may get to a point where they have a little air condition unit you can put on your head and you can move about and do whatever it is that you do and you can feel safe well the only problem with that is that they have to create a port that the saxophone mouthpiece can fit through yeah. without allowing well, well any- you know now that's the one disadvantage <laughs> that we have and it's something that you know i have to maintain with people that okay you have to wear a mask i can't wear a mask so you know we got to have the distance and you got to be masked up to protect me yeah. and well protect yourself. So, you know, that I don't spread anything to you. So I think, yeah, man, but you know, you said that, yeah, I think, man, we're going to start seeing the blow up bubbles with little fans and it's so, uh, Hey, we can go and it'll have some, uh, some type of apparatus so we can hear. And then that way, Hey, we'll be able to go back out into the world yeah and do it and we'll be stylish (laughs) well and leave it up to us we'll make it stylish i mean you know (laughs) folks were just wearing those those blue masks and then you know sister girl put her african spin on it now you're wearing kente cloth and on your face and you know it it's all good um yeah so you you talked about uh adapting and you know when it comes to music and the way music is delivered as a product we've seen some significant changes i mean both you and i came up in a day where you know if you wanted to listen to music you would put a record on a turntable and put the needle on the record and you would hear the music or if you were really sophisticated you had a reel-to-reel tape deck you know oh yeah oh yeah and it it went from that to eight tracks and then from eight tracks to cassettes, and then we went from cassettes to CDs, and now even CDs are past. Say you can buy a car, and there's no place to put your CD. Um, but Horns and Things has been recording music over a period of years. I mean, 37 years. I know you've recorded yeah. something. Yeah. Um, how are you navigating this new world of uh, music as a product? Well, you know, and I and, and as you said, you see, we started out, and I think our first project was a cassette, and then our next was uh, the CD, and uh, and right now we're editing the DVD. But what technology has done is to say, okay, you can take this, I can put it on the platform on the internet, and you can download, Be- because there are the two generations behind us they don't even know what a cassette or a CD is because they've only been downloading music. So, you know, we just have to step the game up and yeah, you can download our music. And fortunately for us, I mean, we've been recording, you know, just about all the time that the group has been together and we have finished products. We have things in the can. So, I mean, we still have more music to come and we just have to change it to the new format um and and as i think about it it's 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 like how they listen to music because you know i had the component set with both speakers and you know now you know these kids listen to music with earbuds Mm -hmm. you know so you know i think that yeah and it's all digital because when we first started it was analog yeah, and there are those who would say that we've lost something because it made that transition from analog to digital. But um, I also wanted to talk to you since you raised a point about demographic because, you know, I, I'm not sure, and I could be completely wrong, you have a much better feel for who your audience is, but I would have to imagine that most of those who would be compelled to buy your music would probably buy a CD. You know, and that's one of the, the 
points where we are. We're at a point where we still have to make some CDs, but for the most part, uh, our generation has got to get ourselves together to realize we need to, uh, you know, we have to address the download. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so many things uh, have just changed for us so that we have to say to ourselves, hey, it's not that way anymore. Um, And we're learning because this COVID has got it to where there are people who had to navigate to see these concerts online. Yeah. You know, so I think that we're going to, uh, you know, we'll make the adjustment because the world is, has changed. And I think a lot of times, you know, I always think the positive, a lot of times people will come out to hear you play, but they really don't feel like getting dressed up. You know, it's been a long day and we intended to do it, but I just don't feel like getting dressed up, getting in the car, driving. And now, you know, hopefully in the future we'll have to where, okay, you don't have to come to the venue. You can still catch us and you'll be able to dial in on us on our YouTube channel or whatever and catch the concert. So I, I think that um, the download is here to stay. In fact, I think in five years, downloading is going to be, you know, obsolete. They'll probably have another method by which, you know, we'll be catching music. Yeah, it'll probably get to a point where you just think the song and it plays in your brain <laughs> miraculously. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, you but, know, so. but yeah, I just wanted to to raise that point because in the past, you know, people would come to your show and then you're able to offer them a product on the spot. And, yeah. you know, the thing about, especially if you go the independent route, if you are selling a product that you have been solely responsible for in terms of the creation and production and proliferation of it, you're going to get more of that money back. But if you go the, the route that we used to go, and that is to sign a contract with the recording company and then let them handle everything, you might get a couple of cents out of that $15 that was paid for that CD. But when you are in complete control of the product, you make your money less whatever expenses you incurred in creating it. Yeah, which which again means that I could sell less copies mm-hmm. and make more, more money. More money, right. Um, and hopefully, as you do that, you'll be able to get a better product or you, if you reach the broad market, that you'll, you'll make even, you know, more money and you have more control um, of everything. Right. And, and they, and they have some places on the internet that have been addressing those issues. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. When we come back, you're listening to open door Cleveland with Vince Robinson and my very special guest, Mr. JT Lynch back with more after this. Open Door Cleveland looks at the lives of people here and abroad, navigating the realms of art, culture, and society. I'm Vince Robinson. Tune in for inspired conversation with an array of guests and subject matter experts right here on 95.9 FM WOVU, Monday mornings at 11. Stream us live at WOVU.org or enjoy us live by purchasing the WOVU app from your favorite app store. Open Door Cleveland, Monday mornings at 11 on 95.9 FM WOVU, a Burton Bell Car Community Radio Station. WOVU 95.9 FM. Find us on Facebook. Like our page. Leave us a comment. We are WOVU 95.9, streaming live on WOVU.org. We're back with J.T. Lynch, musician and music educator, co-founder of the group Horns and Things. And uh, before we took this break, we were just talking about how the the musical sharing paradigm has changed from the days of platters, albums, record albums, 45s, 33s, 78s. And now we're doing things with digital downloads and 
we were making the point that if you create the product, you can make more money from it. Uh, and where we are now versus where we were before was folks could come to your show. They could enjoy your concert after the concert was over. They could buy your CD, take it home, listen to it. Now we're in a place where people don't have to get in their cars to see you. They just go online and view you. But the real challenge is how do you monetize that? You know, what a lot of groups are doing is they're sharing their music on platforms like Spotify and Apple Music and um, uh, Jay-Z's platform, which title is, is the name of it. Uh, but the problem with those things is that you can have 500,000 people listen to your your song but you only get paid a few cents for each listen. So, I mean, if it was one cent, one cent, you know, 500,000 people, that's not really a whole lot of money. Um, so I guess the real issue is how can musicians legitimately be compensated for their craft and their work in this age of digital downloads? Well, I think, man, like, like say there's, um, there's one platform on the internet and if you put your music through them, um, one of the things that they do is that if people use your music and they're on YouTube, that they're able to track it and you're able to get compensation uh, for it. It's a new, a new frontier. And even though, you know, like with the the old uh, record contracts, um, you know, you were you could get some name recognition, and your fame and your dates would be what helped you sustain yourself. So I think that as we move forward, I think there are people who are going to be able to move in and address that. I think that. The turn is going to be that you're not going to be able to go on and listen to music, you know, free, like we've been listening to it. It's like TV ain't free no more. I think listening to music is not going to be free. I think that um, the format is going to change. I think rather than you buy a CD that we're going to only allow so many plays for a certain amount of money. Uh, that's just one option. Um, maybe you have a membership uh, to be able to have access. So I look for these kind of things to occur so that artists on every level are able to reap benefits, you know, from their music. So I think that uh, someone or some people are going to come up with a way to say, hey, put your music here rather than Spotify and you'll be able to get some royalties or something. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that we're kind of up against uh, when it comes to playing music uh, for reasons that you just outlined, um, if you're on Facebook, you'll see folks say, I don't own the rights to this music. And if you do play music, there are certain restrictions on what you can play. If it's your music, it's one thing. But if you're playing somebody else's music, and I know, for instance, Horns and Things may do the song, People Make the World Go Round. Well, yeah. if you play that song, what are the implications of playing it on a, a platform like Facebook or YouTube where there might be restrictions? And does it cause you to make adjustments in your choices in terms of music that you share? Oh, definitely. Now, most times with horns and things, anytime that you see us perform a recording, we're playing all original music. Um, because, you know, I think that the stylistics, stylistics, whoever wrote that song, I think that if you play that song, that they should get their due diligence. Because if I wrote a song and someone is playing it, then I, I would expect that. So those are the gray areas that we we have to overcome. Uh, but BMI ASCAP um, 
you know, they have that arrangement, but it's not on this, this platform that we're entering in now. So I think that um, as the market picks up and, and they're able to categorize people, which I hate, um, I think that they'll they'll get away to where in order for you to have access that, you know, you, you've got to pay so much money to be able to listen to this music. And Sirius, Spotify, Facebook, now with uh, Facebook and possibly YouTube, uh, if you go on a, and do a podcast or something and you're using other people's music, they can pick that up and they will knock you off, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, so I know they can detect it. So now it's about how do we get people to realize if you're going to use this music, you're going to have to pay the people, you know, which is a very bad thing we have in the United States, especially. We just think the arts and culture should always be free. Mm -hmm. It is. And it, it's a sad thing because, uh, unfortunately, the artists end up on the losing end of that. You know, I mean, and I'll just take Larchmere Arts as an example. You know, I love to be able to bring, you know, quality acts in there. But audiences, for the most part, really don't support it to the extent that can reward everybody for what they yeah. do. So it, it's, you know, so then we have to look at other sources of funding, you know, I mean, let's keep it real, bro. You've been playing the saxophone for 40 years plus more than likely. And your level of musicianship is the same level of musicianship. As some of those cats that, you know, are seen from coast to coast and around the world, but people are not willing to walk into a place like night town or the Bob stop and horns and things and pay $75, a hundred dollars uh, a person to hear a concert, but you know, they'll go to New York and they'll hear some cat that yeah. plays nowhere near your level and they'll pay that much to hear. Well, you know, in, in my time in dealing when we used to play clubs and I would say to these club owners, you know, it's not that you can't afford me or afford to pay my price. It's that you won't make the people pay. Well, because we live here and was used to so much free. And, you know, I told him, you may take a hit for four or five weeks, but if you go to New York, you go to Chicago, you know, uh, when you walk in the door, you're paying money for the entertainment. You know, it's, you know, I mean, we've all been to those cities where you go to the, you go to the door to go to the club and we get the ticket shot because the people saying, yeah, $45 a person. While you standing there looking, people are coming in, giving the $45 and going on. Mm -hmm. So I think hopefully when this opens back up that, you know, places realize, OK, you cannot walk into a place for free. You know, that's the thing that the people in this region have to understand. That's not going to be free in order for you to go into a place you're going to have to pay so much money mm -hmm. to get into place. And once that becomes the rule, then I think we're going to see our entertainment pick up a bunch of notches because, yeah. you know, like you say, large premier arts, if somebody came, if everybody's paying $50, well, you could bring in so-and-so now. Right. You know, and not so much bring in so-and-so, but I can pay the people here more money. You know, and all of a sudden now we've got something going. But if people knew and it's like, you know, a guy said, well, you know, I got a restaurant. Well, it's easy for you to tell them, you know, you got a discount of price and I'll take it off of your meal. You know, but it's just the fact that you got to get people realizing, you know, just for to me, the whole business thing. When people walk in your door on Thursday, Friday, Saturday and possibly Sunday, they got to pay money that keeps your business going. You can, you can, you can hire better quality um, of musicians, you know, but what happened was the DJ. Yeah. That's that, that so kinda true. Hurt, you know, and I think we're getting to a point where people going to really say, Hey, I need to hear live music. 
Well, yeah, it's the live music, but two, you brought up something earlier about original music, and that's another way that the DJ has hurt, because when people hear music, they want to hear it the way the record hurt sounded. You know, they want yeah. want you to play it like the record, and you can't play it like the record, because yeah. it yeah. was recorded at a... Yeah, I mean, and the closest you can get is, is, is like the odd occasion... And wedding bands mm -hmm. because they specialize in playing those songs that way. But again, because we, you know, we got to adapt and we got to get people to realize that yes, there is a difference between, you know, uh, I, in fact, I've been binging on Gladys Knight and I've been catching her live shows and I just watch to see how many different ways she could sing neither one of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, like we were saying before, Prince said it best. After his generation, uh, the music is going to change because when I came up in order to make music, I had to have some other cats and we come in and make music. You know, now you can sit down at the computer and, and make music. You know, but we're missing that next step. You know, um, you know, we need more than bass and drums to tell our story. You know, we got it. We, we, and I think we're evolving to the point where people are going to want to start hearing music. You know, the the rap, spoken word, all of those are wonderful but we still have to have the music because that's what releases things in your soul. Mm -hmm. You need the chords, you need the pitches. Right. And I, what I really like in terms of, of uh, an idea is original music, you know, not hearing the same song that you've been hearing for 40 years, but hearing something that you've never heard before, but still being able to enjoy it. That's the, yeah. that's the education yeah. that I I would really like to bring to Cleveland audiences. That the fact that yeah. you can enjoy something that you never heard before. Yeah, you know, or like you say, uh, I don't want to go see a group Friday, go see another group Saturday, and they're playing the same songs the group they played Friday's playing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, and there's there's certain amount of creativity that that goes i mean when we start looking at groups like uh the dayton side roger troutman and 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 uh lakeside i think it was lakeside was from dayton mm -hmm. lakeside. these guys had their, had their own brand you know bootsy down in cincinnati hamilton you know that's what we've got to start releasing we got to get people to understand there's a new groove i mean and you know even in my generation different rap artists that I like. You know, I like some of the things that they're saying, and it's like anything else. Uh, <clears throat> if you listen to an R&B station, well, there ain't but a few songs that may catch my ear. I'm not saying the rest of it is no good. I'm just saying those few songs catch my ear. I approach rap the same way. I can't listen to all of it, but just some of it, it's like, yeah. yeah. You know, okay, I, I get this one. Right. You know? So, you know, I think that as time goes on, technology and living in the age of information that somewhere along the line, the kids are going to realize, no, I don't want to sample. I don't want to play it. All right. And that's, you know, see, it's okay to sample, but I want to play it. Right. You know, I don't mind listening to the sample, but I am going to be able to put my, my spin on it. And all the time, cutting and pasting is not going to get you that release. And two, you want to hear the song and not just a fraction of it, because the whole song is the whole song and not something that could be taken in or out of context. Yeah. And, you know, and I want to hear, I think they're going to want to hear this person's expression, not your finesse to manipulate the digital world. Mm hmm but your finesse to be able to create what you're assembling. Okay. You know, when, yeah. Well, what, 
with that, we're going to have to button things up. We have uh, spent an hour together and it's gone by quickly. Uh, we've learned a lot about JT and horns and things and music in general. And I thank you for what you have shared with Cleveland. Well, it's truly my pleasure. And uh, I look forward to uh, our next project together. And hopefully your listeners will tune in and Larchmere Arts will once again give them a unique experience in culture and music. All right. Well, I thank you for that. And I thank you for listening to Open Door Cleveland. This is Vince Robinson and my guest, J.T. Lynch. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. Make it a great day, Cleveland. Peace.